Genevan tunes today, but it's not something new in Brazil that already in the 16th century on the shores of by Rio de Janeiro there they were singing uh, Psalm 5 in the Genevan melody. Uh, yeah, that's uh, something in, in the catechism has already been translated, so it's not a new work here in Brazil. Yep, the Reformed faith first came, I think it was in 1555, some French Reformed people tried to start a colony in Rio de Janeiro, and they were later murdered or massacred or exiled by the Roman Catholics here. And then in the 1600s, the Dutch came, and they took over for a while, 1630 to 1654, they were here in Pernambuco, and like uh, Reverend Vince Francis said, they translated the Catechism even into the Indian language. So that was amazing. A lot of mission work was done. They had two classes here and they had like 20 ministers and all kinds of church planners. And back then they didn't have half the resources that we have now. So it's, it's pretty amazing what they did. Yeah, so when people ask us if this new Reformed Church is a new thing, we said no, our baptismal registry goes way back to the 1600s here in Recife. So it's not a, a new thing. It's wonderful that we can be able to say that uh, as well. Yep, church at Recife has a, has a, has a records of baptisms done in the 17th century for the Reformed Church of Recife. It's amazing. But then of course we're kicked out by the Portuguese and for a long time Roman Catholicism continued. The, the Reformed Indians fled into the interior and, and tried to maintain the Reformed faith but after a number of generations it did die out. They sent letters to Holland asking for ministers but it just wasn't possible given the political situation back then. And then we have the Reformed faith coming back in the 19th century with the Presbyterians and the Congregationalists. Yeah, they recently celebrated 150 years of being here in Brazil, uh, preaching, teaching uh, the Reformed confessions, the Reformed faith. And that's, that was good. However, there is a, there's a, uh, something that we should say about that as well. The, the Presbyterian churches, the, the missionaries were either fundamentalists or modernists. So the fundamentalists are kind of dispensationalists, um, you know, they're very much, you know, don't drink and don't smoke and don't dance and that's what Christianity is all about, very moralistic. And the modernists were basically liberals, they didn't believe in the supernatural uh, things that are recorded in the Bible. So even though the Reformed faith came back and, and the Presbyterian Church's Reformed Confessions, the Westminster Standards, were introduced, uh, it, even by the admission of the top scholars in the, in the Presbyterian Church of Brazil, it wasn't uh, really a full orbed reformed confessional church that was planted. Yeah, they always highlight that it's not never been a confessional uh, church. I think that's important to keep in mind. And so when the missionaries that came from Canada came, that's the situation they came into, and they wanted to recognize and respect the work that had already been done. And so that's how they chose uh, where they would start the work. So Reverend Vince Bronson, not this one, but his father, was the first missionary, I think 1970? Yes. And he came and he, he started the work this more than 40 years ago. Maranatha Church in Surrey sent him out together with the support of the Western churches of the Canadian Reform churches. And he, he began work in San Jose up here in the Northeast in an unevangelized area. Uh, the fruit of the work of those first missionaries. Oh it's yeah. It's a great privilege to be where we are uh, they did all the hard work at the beginning. Uh, they were out there walking on the beaches, uh, preaching in a building that was empty. No one came, but they kept preaching and they kept preaching. And that preaching uh, way at the beginning is, is uh, bearing fruit now, 40 years later. More fruit than we can, we can gather. We need a lot more uh, men uh, now. There are those, the Bible speaks about those who sow and, and those who reap. And we've been very privileged that we're allowed to be reaping the fruits of, of what these men have sown. Uh, preaching, teaching, uh, some of the key elders that they've trained, um, but also the hard work they've done on, on translating the, the Reformed Confessions, the Three Forms of Unity. Hard work, many, many, many hours and years of hard labor working on translations and, and versifications of the Psalms that we still use today. So we are greatly blessed to be able to reap Reverend Vince Bronson said, far more fruit than we can even handle. It's a glorious harvest here, and, and it's just the beginning. Things are 
get even, even bigger uh, all the time. I often think of in the Bible, there's the, the one point where uh, the prophet was on Mount Carmel and it hadn't rained for many years and he saw this, he was waiting for, for rain and, and, and he keeps sending his servant to look and finally the servant says, yeah, there's a tiny little cloud about the size of a man's hand. And then the prophet says to uh, it was King Ahab, yes, he says, uh, run, fly, because it's going to rain. And I think that's the, the clouds are gathering in Brazil. We're just seeing the, these glorious, abundant fruits that we're reaping from these first missionaries are just the beginning of a great harvest, what looks like to be a great harvest. And using the same analogy to, to describe a little bit of the work we're doing, uh, to use the idea of rain, it's, uh, we, we say it often, it's like rain on, on parched ground. Uh, no matter how much water we pour onto, into this country, no, much, no matter how much preaching, teaching, it just is, is getting being absorbed and, and sucked in like water on parched ground. So it's a great blessing to be working at this time. It's a beautiful situation in which to work. And I think it's hard for us to imagine because back in Canada, we live in a very secular society and, and people just aren't interested in hearing about the Lord Jesus. And, you know, it's almost a, offensive socially to, it's a, it's a social gap to start speaking about religion. But it's just absolutely phenomenal here that we, we have total freedom anywhere at any time to, to speak to people. And not only that, not only are people open to hearing the gospel, but people come searching for it. People call us, please come and preach. If we wanted to, we could be preaching and teaching 24 hours a day. And that's not an exaggeration. It's a country of 200 million people. And there's a famine here in this country. Not a famine of bread, but there's a famine of the living preaching of the Word of God. And if, we, if we're seeing people drinking the, the, the preaching in, it's not because we're such good preachers. It's because there's such a famine that people just, any preaching which is, which is faithful to the scriptures, they latch onto and they, they long for. A lot of talk uh, nowadays, we're talking about the, the Great Reformation today or the Reformation today in Brazil. And I, I think it's important to explain to the context behind that. Why do we talk about a Reformation here in Brazil? There's been so much work and so much time. Maybe uh, you could, I think that's good to talk about too. You're right. We need to understand that in Brazil, about 90 to 95 percent of the population call themselves some kind of Christian, either Roman Catholic or so-called evangelical. And yet, um, even though a lot of people talk about the name Jesus and the name Christ, he's not really known uh, amongst a lot of people, a lot of church groups. What we have in the Roman Church, of course, we know because we studied it in our catechism lessons and and we've been freed from that uh, back in the time of the Great Reformation, the, the, the works righteousness and uh, the, the apostasy from the scriptures. But what we have in the so-called uh, evangelical groups here in Brazil, there's a lot of health and wealth movement. So preachers are saying, you know, come to Jesus, believe in Jesus, and you won't get sick anymore, and you'll also become very rich. Well, that's, that's simply not the gospel. It's a, it's a false gospel that it appeals to man's carnal desires and doesn't deal with man's real need, which is forgiveness of sin and reconciliation with God. So the situation in which we're working is a lot of people calling themselves Christians, but very few really knowing Christ and very few having access to the living preaching of the gospel of grace. So we compare it with the time of the Great Reformation in the sense of, um, in the time of the Great Reformation too, or, you know, many of you watching are from Dutch descent or English descent and European descent and at the time of the Great Reformation uh, most of Europe considered itself Christian but people were dying without knowing Christ and knowing the grace of Christ and so we're thankful that the early reformers went out and preached Christ they didn't say well you know Holland's it's all Christian so we won't bother preaching there no they went and preached Christ they preached grace and there was a great reformation that happened in, in Holland and, and, and in, in England and in other European countries. And today we're beneficiaries of that. And what we're seeing in Brazil is much the same thing, right? Uh, I think it's very important to notice that uh, Brazil was discovered before the reformation happened in, in Europe in the 1500, uh, right before. But so that uh, R Roman Catholic Church in Europe, that's what came here to Brazil. And it was only later, with a little bit of influence of some Protestant preaching, 
that you have this doctrine of grace in the Reformed Church that we talked about. We also mentioned how many times it was beaten back and, and the men were killed. And so that type of uh, Roman Catholicism pre-Reformation and not, not post-Reformation is the foundation of this country. And it shows uh, in a lot of the pictures you've seen and you can see in the country. They, they even talk about a Roman Catholic work ethic and it, it comes through uh, in the understanding of the priests, the whole folk religion. Uh, there's pictures of that, you can really see the mixture. And so what happened in Brazil is, is there's a Roman Catholicism that is different than you see in Spain, than you see in Europe. It's uh, less affected um, by some of the changes that had happened. And, and surprisingly, it doesn't seem to make sense, but it seems that after 500 years, a lot of the same, the same context, a lot of the same things are being taught, are being uh, said, are being believed with this mixture with the African religions because of the, uh, they imported so many slaves uh, into the country here. And so the Roman Catholicism here is a works righteousness that's mixed with a spiritism. Uh, and then when you, when you look at that and you compare that to the Pentecostal and the so-called evangelical churches, so-called Pentecostal too, uh, neo-Pentecostal, they have the same idea, the same works righteousness, the same mixture even between uh, the, the, our task here on earth and the, the involvement of the Spirit, their interpretation of the Holy Spirit is very similar to a lot of the African Spiritism. So when we see the name Jesus since 1500 here in Brazil, you see it all over the place, that Jesus is not the Jesus, the Lord Jesus of scriptures that, that we, we are able to preach. In fact, it's a, it's a completely different Lord Jesus that's loaded with all sorts of different meaning that comes from the African spiritism, that comes from the, the original Roman Catholic teaching, that comes from these extreme Pentecostal ideas that come from North America. Uh, and so the, the context we work in looks Christian in the first glance, but ask just a few questions uh, and you, you will readily see that it's, it's just a, a cheap veneer. Yeah, so there's a lot of baggage, right? As Reverend Vince once said, a lot of baggage from spiritism and from Roman Catholicism. And um, the so-called evangelical churches in Brazil, the large majority, unfortunately, are nothing more than the Roman Catholic Church with, with different clothes. They're teaching exactly the same thing. You've got to be a good person to get to heaven. You've got to walk your way to heaven using your merits. And when you mess up, well, then you're in trouble. You, you're, uh, you're going to have to pay for it. So there's no, there's no comfort. There's no grace. There's no sovereign grace. And unfortunately, as we heard too in some of the interviews that we'll go we'll here, the, uh, the, the type of church and church life is so completely different that you almost have to question the sincerity. You have ministers who, who, are, who are selling uh, churches one to another. It's a, it's a business, a good businessman. Uh, we heard in Londrina, there's a good businessman. He's making a lot of money. Uh, so he wants to invest in something new. So what does he do? He starts up a church and he makes his son the pastor. Uh, and so then it's a good investment and, and keeps going and gives him son, his son something to do. Um, so we see a lot of this. It, it, it's so sad. It's so sad. The Bible speaks about selling uh, the bodies and souls of men. And that's happening here in Brazil. I've seen an ad in the newspaper, church for sale. And they weren't selling the building. They were selling the congregation. And I've heard of that more often. We've heard of that more often. Uh, entire churches being sold that the pastor says, listen, this is how much it makes per month, this is how many people there are, so you, you can take it over and you can pay me on monthly payments for 12 months and you can pay me X and then you can take over the church and, and start living off the proceeds. And uh, the devil's having a field day as he's uh, mocking and ridiculing the work of God in these so-called churches.
cidade do nosso Deus será Estou vendo o que está acontecendo. Deus está cuidando de você por meio da sua mãe e do seu pai. Deus mesmo. Está vendo? Daquele que criou todo o universo, as árvores, o mar, as montanhas, ele que criou tudo isso. Ele está cuidando de você. Imagine, criador cuidando de você. Coisa bonita, né? Ele está fazendo isso por meio da sua mãe. Está usando sua mãe. Sua mãe é uma serva de Deus. Deus disse, eu quero cuidar dessa criança. Então, seu pai, sua mãe, são servos de Deus para...
Primeiramente, agradecer a Deus por ter transformado o meu coração de pedra, no... ter quebrantado o meu coração. Né? Sobre o conhecimento da palavra de Deus que a gente lá só ouvia, né? e você nunca lia a Bíblia, nem se aprofundava assim, do que você ouvia, porque tinha um, bolet... é, um jornalzinho né? e você nunca usava a Bíblia, só aquele jornal. Então você começa a despertar né, e a fazer perguntas e querer cada vez mais saber mais da palavra de Deus. Dentro da igreja romana é um, muito uma espécie de quase que, posso dizer, misticismo. Né? Algumas coisas que você faz, que isso vai determinar que você é fiel. Né? O fato de às vezes só ir na igreja no domingo, participar da comunhão, fazer os sinais da cruz. Então, coisas que às vezes ele falava, mas de fato você não conhecia nada sobre Deus. Né? Se falava de Deus, nada. Sobre a Bíblia não era aberta. Né? Como eu falei desse tempo que eu participava lá, e que a gente sempre se reunia para ter algum tipo de evento ou estudo, mas nunca era para estudar a Palavra de Deus. Né? Então era uma catequese que eu também participei, mas era só com o ensinamento da igreja, da tradição da igreja mas nada da Palavra de Deus. Então, ao começar a participar na, na Igreja Reformada aqui em Maragogi, foi, de fato, o primeiro contato que eu tive com a Bíblia. Né? Então, aquilo foi ficando curioso e interessante como Deus usa, porque parece que a cada domingo, cada escola dominical, cada aula dos jovens, cada estudo bíblico, parece que as dúvidas iam sendo esclarecidas e... Aquilo ia provocando uma, uma mudança também na, na, na vida, no comportamento. E os colegas também podiam ver isso, né? E a família também podia ver isso. Então, sim, essa é a diferença. E realmente a palavra de Deus mudando a sua vida e algo que é um mero misticismo, um mero costume, né? prática, o, quase como um ritual. Quando você recebe um conhecimento mais amplo, que te abre os seus olhos, pra... então tudo muda. Quando conhecemos a fé, reforma... a fé reformada, então tudo isso mudou. Porque nós começamos a é, dar menos valor às coisas externas e mais valor né, às coisas internas, às coisas espirituais. É, eu prometo a Deus, né? nós conhecemos irmãos reformados, especialmente os missionários, como o pastor Kennedy, especialmente o pastor Júlio, e aí a gente passou a conhecer o melhor e, resumindo, hoje nós fazemos parte dessa grande família de Cristo. E como o presbítero o senhor disse, a minha primeira impressão também foi essa, foi de, 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 de mais seriedade, de mais compromisso, de mais dedicação, e a cada dia a gente vai enxergando isso, conforme também hoje observa o pastor Kennedy, Durante esses anos em Porto Calvo, eu participava bem da Igreja Católica Romana. No meu conhecimento, na época, duas igrejas. Ou você era católico romano, ou você era crente. E naquelas aulas que a gente tinha na Igreja Romana, praticamente era ensinado a você odiar a Igreja um crente. Né? E mais ou menos foi assim que eu cheguei. Em Maragogi, me mudei para Maragogi e na minha mente eu tinha isso certo, mesmo tão adolescente ainda, né, com 13 anos, de que eu nunca ia ser um crente, que a igreja verdadeira era a igreja romana. E isso mudou quando eu cheguei em Maragogi e comecei, conheci primeiramente Tiago, porque ele estudava junto com Tiago, que hoje é pastor Tiago, né? E ele morava junto com o vizinho, 
a mim lá em Maragogi e a gente estudava junto na mesma escola em Porto Calvo. Então, todo dia a gente ia para essa escola em Porto Calvo, pentecostais, se precisava muito, às vezes, coisas talvez como roupas longas, corte de cabelo, não jogar um futebol. E eu pude ver que ele apresentava ser um homem, um adolescente já fiel a Deus, mesmo sem isso ser a coisa de mais importante. Então a gente sempre conversava sobre a Bíblia, né? sempre fazia perguntas a ele sobre a Bíblia, ele sempre explicava e sempre falava sobre, sobre Deus, sobre muitas coisas. É, foi através da minha irmã, porque ela foi participar de uma escola bíblica de férias. Eu próprio era perseguidor da igreja reformada. E eu amava a igreja romana. Para mim era a igreja. A igreja de Cristo, era a igreja verdadeira. E quando chegou a igreja reformada, né? Eu já próprio tinha algumas dificuldades de, de, de ver os pentecostais. E quando a igreja reformada chegou como uma igreja evangélica também, para mim era uma outra seita. Nós nos juntamos para fazer coisa paralela para destruir o trabalho da igreja reformada. Então, por exemplo, quando o João, né, foi um dos que vinha da missão auxiliar, João e Tereza, eu, para mim, eu sempre dizia, aquele maloqueiro, aquele cara ali e tal, a gente tem que fazer alguma coisa para destruir o trabalho deles. Então, eu não queria ir lá naquela igreja, mas Deus usou, né, a irmã de Beto, que fez a EBF, e para pegar esse documento. Então eu fiquei bem atrás da igreja, <risos> escondido. Eu tava, tinha até vergonha de estar ali, porque... Mas Deus já tinha estava trabalhando na minha vida, né? Fiz dar aula de religião e já tinha muitas dificuldades e perturbações mesmo. Eu lembro que uma vez fui dar uma aula e eu estava chorando, porque não consegui dar, e... porque eu comecei a ler a Bíblia. Comecei a ler a Bíblia, então tinha dificuldade de, de, de dar aquela aula. Eu tinha dificuldade na aula e fui na casa do padre várias vezes. E ele, Moisés, você tem problema, deixa a Bíblia, fecha a Bíblia. Você não precisa se preocupar com isso. E naquele dia, para minha surpresa, o pastor falando lá, era como se Deus estivesse batendo no meu coração, batendo. Porque era quase as perguntas que eu, e o pastor lá pregando... Parece que estava respondendo aquilo que eu tinha tanta dificuldade, tantos meses atrás, correndo atrás para resolver. Então, naquele momento, eu disse, eu posso, terminou, todo mundo saiu, eu fiquei lá com vergonha. Mas eu disse ao pastor Pedro, eu posso ir na sua casa amanhã, que era um dia de sábado. E aí começou essa virada, onde eu, com certeza o Espírito Santo estava trabalhando a minha campo. Depois de, do carnaval, tem a quarta-feira de cinza. E naquela quarta-feira de cinza, os católicos têm o costume de é, beijar os pés da imagem de Cristo e colocar cinza. E naquele dia, uma freira queria que eu fosse beijar aquele, aquela estátua lá. E eu disse a ela que não ia. E ela ficou me forçando e eu disse que não ia. Então, isso foi numa quarta. E no domingo eu fui participar do culto da Igreja Reformada. E meu pai também tinha um comércio, e esse comércio também é, ele tem um comércio, e esse comércio funciona no domingo. E depois eu disse, ó ah, pai, eu já ajudava ele, já na, nessa adolescência. E eu disse, ó ah, pai, eu não vou trabalhar mais no domingo também. Então ele sempre, assim, não aceitava isso e queria que eu trabalhasse. Isso também era... Muito difícil para mim. Acordar para isso, de que tem que realmente assumir essa missão que cada membro deve ter de levar o Evangelho, de pregar a palavra, de fazer discípulos. Então esse é um dos planos que o Conselho de Maragogi agora está tentando fazer de realmente animar esses homens, incentivar esses homens 
treinar esses homens com estudos, também ter maior comunhão, para que assim possa ter homens para colher né, dessa seara que é, realmente é grande, está branca e acho que a maior necessidade é essa de trabalhadores, essa colheita. É, o Brasil precisa da, da verdade. Né? É, eu gosto de seguinte, se, se em todas as igrejas hoje que nós temos no nosso país, que se diz igreja evangélica, elas pregassem a Cristo como as igrejas formadas têm, pré, têm pregado a palavra de Deus, né? falando de arrependimento, mostrando realmente o pecado das pessoas, com certeza nós teríamos um Brasil totalmente diferente. Então, é, eu acredito, né? espero que, se for essa a vontade de Deus, né? que a igreja reformada né? Ela possa crescer cada vez mais e expandir de maneira que muitas e muitas pessoas possam realmente conhecer esse evangelho maravilhoso que é. As pessoas realmente comprometidas com a palavra. I think it's really important to remember that uh, we as Canadian Reformed Churches are the supporting church, the, that church that's uh, accompanying and, and assisting the Reformed Churches in Brazil uh, with the most resources and the most involvement. Uh, and we're able to do this in our lifetime. There's uh, millions of people who have never heard of the faith, of the, of the gospel of Jesus Christ, of grace, of forgiveness, of eternal life uh, completely coming from God. And we can see this in our lifetime, and this is what we believe. We can preach it. Uh, it's in our lifetime we have this opportunity, and it's very important as we look forward to the future that we use uh, this, uh, our resources, uh, to the glory of God uh, in, a, in a wise, wise way. Some of the ways that we can do that uh, in, in the first place, very clearly, we all, we all need to be praying uh, with, with a great urgency, great, uh, with a fervent desire to see uh, these millions of people in this country who do not know the gospel of Jesus Christ and who will not be saved without outside of Jesus Christ. We need to pray that they can hear uh, the pure preaching of the gospel. This is a very important thing to them. Yeah, faith comes by hearing and hearing comes by the word of God, the word of Christ. So. The only hope that the sinner has is to hear the living preaching of the Word. That's what the Holy Spirit uses to regenerate hearts and to change lives and to save sinners. We're very thankful for decades of support from all of the Western churches, all of the churches in Western Canada. And we're especially thankful for the over and above support that some of the churches have also given throughout the years. I want to especially thank the church at Yarrow for sacrificially giving to support the CTA, the ATC, depends on if you say it in Portuguese or, or in English, the Aldea Training Center. We want to thank the church at Yarrow for supporting the Aldea Training Center, uh, the library there, the, the, the Instituto João Calvino, the seminary. Uh, the, the library there is often full of people studying, learning, making reform websites, preparing sermons, studying Hebrew, Greek, hermeneutics, uh, lectures are being given, training is happening every month for, for future office bearers. There are just so many things happening at the ATC and they wouldn't be possible without this, this project which Yarrow has taken on above and beyond its regular mission commitment. And we see the mission work along the coast where Maragogi has a missionary work in a number of little towns around Maragogi. And that work is supported by the church at Linden, and that's also just that should be phenomenal. The, the church at Maragogi is able to do mission work and plant congregations, uh, a work which otherwise it would not be able to do without the support. We'd like to encourage all of the supporting churches. Uh, sometimes there are, there are churches that want to get more involved and be involved more directly. Well, there are possibilities for that. Uh, we, we, we look forward to the day when this country of 200 million people will have the living preaching of the Word of God in every major town and, and city and village, that, that, the, that every Brazilian has access to this gospel of grace. And so we can use more um, extra projects to support church planters and to plant new churches in new areas.
I think we should uh, think too of the importance of the theological seminary. Let's call it a church planters training center. Uh, the goal there, of course, is to, to, to reach all these people. And in that, uh, the support of the theological education in various ways that can be done. Uh, but also those who, who are leaving this and to have uh, churches supporting preachers once they've passed through the seminary. This, this is the direction that we need to go as churches here in Brazil. It's the preaching of the gospel. Uh, as it was done at the time of the Great Reformation, the focus on the preaching of Scripture. Uh, and along with that, I think we should really think too of the importance of literature and the importance of the literature that we've been seeing already, how the, the, it's just been so important in the spread of the gospel here in, in Brazil. And we need to put, we, we need to get serious uh, about this. Even though there are editors who are doing a lot of publishing, there's a lot to be done yet. It's our desire to see within the next 15 years a hundred new church planters out there planting reformed churches. And that sounds like a lot, but it is possible uh, as we as we continue to leverage the Instituto João Calvino, the seminary of the churches, and train new men. Uh, we think that's a realistic number to, to look at within the next 15 years. And we expect great things. As the gospel's preached, then great things happen. And the more preachers there are, the more great things happen, the more lives are touched, the more lives are changed, the more lives are transformed. And the kingdom of God advances with power. And so please pray, pray for the work here, pray for the churches here, pray for the training of office bearers, and pray for the preparation and training of future ministers. That's where it's at. That's, that's what's needed in Brazil. That's what's going to change this country. The, the lively and living preaching of the word of God. And for that, we need more preachers and lots more preachers. Uh, first of all, it's nice to, to be part, uh, a sporting part of so much work happening. It's, um, it's a beautiful thing to see how God is working here. Um, it's a wonderful thing for our family to be, um, to be part of such a growing congregation. Our kids have friends in the congregation. We have uh, brothers and sisters here. Um, so in that way, it's, uh, we're, not, we're not alone at all that way. Um, it's, uh, of course, the one downside is that um, there's so much work to do. <laughs> so um, my husband has to travel all the time not all the time, to a lot of different places. He's getting requests for that all, a lot. Uh, so that puts, of course, a strain on our family. We miss him. I just have to remember what we're doing here, the reason we're here, and talk to my husband a lot, participate in as much I can, as I can, know what's going on, and that reminds me why we're here. And then I think about people's lives being changed and the kingdom growing, then I, that, that gives me motivation to continue. And I think just like anybody in any situation, you pray and depend on the Lord for the strength you need and He always gives what you need. There are specific challenges here that are different, but I don't know that it's so much harder than life anywhere else you after you it's at first it is because it's something unfamiliar but it's when you when you get to know it adjust and then you yeah, God gives you the strength to continue day by day um, we try to keep it very routine um, for our kids, very nice. We have, um, although we visit a lot of different congregations, we have our own home congregation, which is the closest here. So that's the congregation that we know the best. Um, then also, so that we really tried to do that for our family, so we have really stability in the home. Um, we also then, so he has to travel, yes. But then when he's here, he's very present. He's very involved with the family. He has a lot of time to spend with me and with the kids. 
Well, nowadays we have Skype. Uh, Skype with family is always encouraging. Uh, talking to my parents or my sister for encouragement. Or brothers and sisters in the church visiting. Or now the other missionaries, which is a huge blessing for us to have another missionary family around. So Karen and I can help each other out. They, they do a lot when Ken is gone and we try to do help Karen out when Julius is traveling. And now we have Chris and Tessia too. So our community is growing. So before I went to uh, Brazil, I didn't know a ton about Maranatha Mission besides what I had saw already on tours as well online on Facebook and on the websites. I always had an interest for Maranatha Mission. I was always interested in the work they did, uh, but I really never knew to the fullest of what all happened in Brazil. That is when I actually took the time to, I thought of this idea to go to Brazil, uh, film a documentary, and as well really learn about Maranatha Mission. I was privileged to go, and of course, thank you to all the donors, to the churches across Canada, and to everyone who supported the project. My perception changed drastically when I went to Brazil. I learned that it was a place that had so much. I never knew that the work they had done was so broad. Um, I knew that it was two men that were missionaries that worked in Brazil. I knew that there was one mission worker that worked together. They all had families, uh, they preached the Word of God, and they really taught people what really mattered in Brazil. So when I was there, I was shocked by how much was in Brazil. I was shocked by the work they did, the people they impacted, and as well, even with that language barrier, I really saw people change. I had one gentleman that came up to the car and asked what the book was that was beside us in the vehicle when we were driving to a Cleary one night, and it was a Bible. Someone that was actually interested and he asked about the Bible and he wanted to go and learn more. Now I can see that it's not a small project and I also know from after filming uh, over 250 gigabytes of footage and, and photos, I can see that this is not a, a small project that I did in six weeks, but really I probably could have stayed for a full year. I probably could have stayed there and kept filming and kept translating and of course um, learning language would have been great because I could have done a lot of that on my own, but there's so much to do, and this could be a documentary that could be hours and hours and hours on end, but of course, here it is, as you saw, uh, a good hour of footage and film uh, that really, I think, I hope impacted, and it showed you the work that's in Brazil. Um, my perception has changed drastically. I hope yours did too, because really, there's, uh, there's so much more to show, and uh, for all those that want to go, go. It's a good chance to learn about the work, to see God at work, and to see really people's lives change. So if you're young, if you're older, go. So again, I just want to thank everybody for uh, really supporting this documentary. Uh, across Canada, everybody has been a huge help as well in Brazil. This is an amazing project, and again, thank you for being here today to watch the documentary. And I really want to encourage everybody to just continue to watch Facebook, continue to read the newsletters, and really stay intact with what's happening. It's an amazing project. The men are doing amazing things out there. And again, I just want to thank everybody for coming here today.